Hey guys, welcome to the Elevate online experience. If you've been here before, welcome back. And if you haven't, sit down, relax and enjoy. If you're enjoying the content so far, we're doing awesome content like this every week. So give us a like, a subscribe, or share us with your friends. We're really lucky to have music today coming from today's community church in the United Kingdom and Gateway Church in Melbourne, Australia.
Today, we're really blessed to have some awesome footage of our mate, Janine, who's been at our church for a few years now. She's making Jesus her king, and we'd like to share it with you guys. So I was born in Kenya as a refugee camp, and since it was a refugee camp, there was a lot of people there, and I ended up getting sick really often, sick to the point my mother was scared that I would die. Uh, I thank Jesus that I'm still alive despite all the illnesses and then we were able to move to Australia with five other families I think. 
Coming to Australia was a new experience for me. I didn't know anyone. I was still like four years old, so it was a whole new experience. But with Jesus, we managed to overcome the difficulty of every single thing that we are just alive and happy right now. Despite the modern day problems and everything, I still feel happy that I am lucky enough to be able to come to Australia and that I thank Jesus for everything that he has done. Jesus was always there, no matter what, no matter how young I was, he was always there, he was always protecting us. Um, there are times where I did that with Jesus was there, but he was always there, he just found a way to show me he was there and I'm thankful for that. I'm getting baptized to open up a new pathway for me to be with Jesus completely, to never doubt him. I want to get baptized to start a fresh life or something. So like peel off my old life and start a new one. I want to be the new me, the best me. So with Jesus, I believe I can do that. To me, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God and then he died for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And have you accepted him as Lord of your life? Yes. Today's message is coming from our mate in sunny Southern California, Charlie. Enjoy. Elevate Church, it is so good to be with you. I know many of you don't know who the heck I am. My name is uh, Charlie, uh, last name's Moulton, and uh, I'm a friend of uh, Mark and Louie, and uh, what a delight to be with you. Uh, I'm actually located right now in Southern California. Does that ring a bell, California? I know you've been hearing about us, right? You know, I just want you to know something, a little inside information. Everything you heard, it's true. Every bit of it. Hey, looking forward to getting into God's Word with you this morning. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been desperate? Have you been so desperate for God to intervene in some aspect of your life or someone that you care about? Are you desperate now? I know a lot of people that I've been talking to have been a bit desperate about a lot more things these days than they have been in times past. You know, as you thought about that question, you know, what are you desperate for? Who are you? desperate for. The prophet Isaiah, whom we're going to be talking about in this teaching, he understands something. He understands that desperate times always call for desperate measures. You know, Isaiah's desperation, if you will, is captured for us in what is considered to be one of the greatest prayers on revival in the entire Bible. You know, this prayer is captured for us so that we can actually go back and read this prayer about revival. And it starts, the prayer starts in Isaiah 63, verse 15. Before I actually read uh, the verse or some of the verses, I want you to keep in mind that, again, this is a prayer about revival. Isaiah, as I've shared with you, is a desperate man. He's desperate. He's needy. As I say often, he's a needy recipient of God's grace. He needs God to intervene. Now, Isaiah, in this desperate prayer, he prays like a desperate man prays. It's a desperate prayer. I said the word desperate, 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 right? So it's not a nice, neat little prayer. It's not orderly. It's not tidy. The prayer that we're going to be looking at today, it's raw. The prayer is earnest. The prayer is honest. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to look around God's Word, specifically Isaiah 63, 15 through 64, 12. And in doing so, we're going to learn some things. We're going to learn why, in fact, Isaiah was desperate for the Lord and, for, and why he was wanting God to intervene. Now, the main idea of the text, or, or the big idea, if I could summarize this passage in one sentence, I'll do the best I can to do that for you here, it would be this. Those who feel the lack of God's working should cry out to him to come down in power to make his name known. Let me say that again. Those who feel the lack of God's working should cry out to him to come down in power and to make his name known. 
In Isaiah 63, 15, it says this, look down. So Isaiah is talking to God. Remember, it's a prayer. So Isaiah says, God, look down. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. Now, that starts off, the prayer does anyways, it, start, it starts off a bit proper, but it's going to change. Remember, I told you he's desperate. Look at the remainder of 6315. He says, where are your zeal and your might, the stirring of your inner parts and your compassion are held back from me? Let me translate this uh, for some of you that need a little bit of Greek this morning, okay? The translation is this, God, where are you? That's what that means. So that'll give you a flavor of where we're going this morning. Lord, help us. I mean, that's what we're going to start seeing in this text as it unfolds. Lord, where is your power? We can grab that from the text here. Lord, where is your compassion? God, where is your compassion? I'm not feeling any compassion right now. That's the message here. He's saying, you're holding back on us, Lord. You're not giving us uh, compassion. You're not giving us what we need. We need you, God. We need you to intervene. He's saying, Lord, would you demonstrate your power? I know you got power, God. Would you, would you intervene? Would you demonstrate that your power? Would you do so by, by coming into our crazy world? And some of you would be saying, I've got a crazy world myself. Well, that's what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, it's crazy down here. Intervene. Intervene to the place to which I currently reside, Lord. He wants the Lord to look down so that he can see what it is that he's up against. He's desperate. Only God can help him. You know, give you a bit of context about what's going on here in history is, first of all, if you don't know, Isaiah is a prophet. Now, a prophet is one who speaks for God. Some would say he's God's mouthpiece, right? He represents God. And Isaiah, as a prophet, has been given some information here. Through God's Spirit, he is able to see something. He's able to see 100 years into the future. So he sees 100 years in the future, so he sees what's going to happen to God's people, okay? Now, what he sees is frightening. What he sees is not good. It's not a good scene, if you will. You see, one of the reasons why it's not good is the people of God, the people whom he's praying for, they have strayed from God. They've gotten away from God. Now, God hasn't moved. They have. They no longer look like God's people. They no longer act like God's people. As a matter of fact, the text says they look unrecognizable to their ancestors. Abraham doesn't recognize them. Israel doesn't recognize them. Why is that? They don't even look like God's people. They don't act like God's people. They're in bad shape. On top of all of this, as Isaiah peeks into the future, Isaiah sees something. And guess what he sees? He sees that they're no longer free. They're in captivity. And to make it worse, as this nightmare couldn't get any worse, they're under the rule and reign of the Babylonians. The Babylonians would be kind of the equivalent of North Korea, if you will. These are bad actors. These are not good people. They're not helpful to God's people. They are a brutal regime. It's a desperate time. Remember what I said to you? Desperate times call for desperate measures. And Isaiah is now going to do something. He's going to take his place in, in, in history. He's going to take his place in history and be God's man and be the intercessor for a people who need an intercessor. So with that in view, let's take a look at verses 15 through 19. Let me read to you. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. Where are your zeal and your might? The stirring of your inner parts and your compassion. They're held back from me. What's he saying? He's saying, where are you, God, right? He says, for you are our father. Though Abraham, though Abraham does not know us, remember, they don't recognize him, and Israel does not acknowledge us. Now, why is that, church? They have strayed. They've strayed so far 
that the ancestors wouldn't be able to recognize them if they were sitting in the same room, if a time machine situation was to take place. So again, he says, you, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from old is your name. Verse 17, O Lord, why do you make us wander from your ways and harden our heart so that we fear you not? Return, return, return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage, your holy people held possession for a little while. Our adversaries, that's the Babylonians, have trampled down your sanctuary. That's like, you know, the bad guys knocking down our church, right? Verse 19, we have become Let's just stop there. We have become. Isaiah includes himself in this. We have become. The church needs to act a whole heck of a lot like that. We're in this thing together. See, the gospel is a community project. You know, it's one of the most divisive times in the history of the church right now. We fight each other sometimes, don't we? Not a time to be fighting. We're in this together. He says, we have become like those over whom have never, so we have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. I like how he weaves in, we're your people. It's almost like, you know, we're yours, <laughs> like it or not, we belong to you. Isaiah is, uh, he's smart. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He knows the character and the attributes of a holy and a righteous God. We'll talk about that in just a moment. What's Isaiah doing? Remember, it's a prayer. Isaiah appeals. He appeals to the Lord's compassion and mercy. That's a good distinguisher of what's going on here. Isaiah is also addressing a great and severe need. You see, a chasm now exists between the people of God and God. And, and not only that, they are so weak or they're too proud to pray for themselves. Let me just say it this way. They've got blind spots everywhere. Have you ever ministered to somebody or do you have somebody in your family or a friend where they don't see their need? It's an obvious blind spot. They don't see it. But someone needs to see it. If you love someone, you, you got to tell them the truth. If you love someone, you got to do what you can do. And Isaiah is in this spot right now where what he can do is he can pray. He can intercede. We can learn a lot from Isaiah. So they may not understand they need God. They might be too weak. Maybe they're too proud, but someone's praying for them. You know, sometimes we pray for those who regularly, who don't have any idea that they have a need. I just shared that with you a second ago. And many times God answers that prayer. He, he opens up the eyes of those who are blind. And God is still working. Even when we think he's not, even when we see, I don't see a lot of fruit. I've been praying for that, that guy, that gal for three months, six months, 25 years. If God has laid that person on your heart, you keep praying, you keep interceding. The text, though, it gives us visibility to something else that I think is important. It gives us visibility that God, that, that Isaiah knows that God is in heaven. Remember, he says, would you look down? He knows where the Lord is. Isaiah understands that God, God is high and he is exalted and he is lifted up. He understands that God is so holy and righteous that he is separated from sinners. And he understands that he is a sinner and he understands that the people that he's interceding for are also sinners. They're desperate, they're needy. With that in view, his understanding that he's the creature and he's the creator, he prays Isaiah 64, 1. He says, oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, Isaiah 64, 1. 
Isaiah, who previously said in Isaiah 63, 15, Oh God, would you look down? Now he says, Oh God, would you come down? You saw what's going on. Now would you come down? Now that is a bold prayer. That is a bold ask. That is a man that knows that he's needy and that he's desperate and he needs God to intervene. There's a reason for that. It's a desperate prayer. It's a prayer that says, Lord, I, 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 we need you. It's a prayer that says, Lord, I, I need you. Your people need you. And he's doing it in such a way like, Lord, come quickly. Maranatha, honest God, would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Desperate prayer. Isaiah, as he looks into this 100 years, I would suspect that he sees little prospect of them actually changing in the future. You see, their sinfulness is too ingrained. Hence the cry, hence the prayer for God to come down. He says, Lord, would you rend the heavens? Not just come down, would you, would you rend the heavens? Would you rip open the sky? It's almost as if Isaiah is understanding something about this God to whom he serves. Remember, he knows God. He knows the character of God. He says, in other words, saying, there's something that's concealing you, God, from us. Oh, God, would you remove that barrier? I pray that God would help you and I to understand that sometimes that we place a barrier between us and God. And we need to go to him and ask him to look down on our plight and intervene. When revival comes, then what? Remember, that's what he's praying for. He's praying for revival. He's praying for God to, inter to intervene into the lives of his people. Let me read to you 64, 1 through 3. It says this, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. Verse 3, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. Isaiah is using metaphors to describe what happens when God actually does come down to his people. If we looked at that text, we could summarize some of it by saying this, when you come down, Lord, mountains quake at your presence. In other words, there is power. When you come down, everything shakes and quakes and you move mountains and you move men. You move mountains of pride. You move mountains of unbelief. You move mountains of materialism and greed. Things change when you come down. You know, when you come down, Lord, you will ensure that your name is known to our oppressors. That is exactly right. When revival comes and when God comes and he shows himself, every tongue will know that he is Lord. Everyone's going to bow down to him. That's for sure. It says here, when you come down, Lord, will you ensure that all nations, all nations tremble at your presence? I would say right now, then it would seem that the world in its entirety seems to shake its fist at God. Oh, however, a time is coming. Brothers and sisters, a time is coming. A time is coming when God will show every single nation who is boss. You hang in there, church. They're going to learn. They're going to learn who is the king and who is the Lord of lords. Revival is when God comes down. Here's a descriptor of revival. Revival is a time when heaven comes closer to earth than any other time in the lives of men and women. Another author explained it this way, revival is not normal. It's the unusual, unusual work of God to stir up a sleepy people and a sleepy church. You can't manufacture revival. Manu revival is, is, is God-centered, not man-centered. Remember the Great Awakening in the 1600s? It, how did it get started? It started with a layman praying, a layman praying. And, and the ingredients for this revival, it was a concern for holiness. There was a concern for accurately, rightfully dividing God's word. There was an understanding of what the gospel was, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I don't know if you noticed this, but in, in chapter 64, verses 1 through 3, 
Every single verse ends with, at your presence, at your presence. I don't even have time to go into that this morning. It is incredible. I, I ask you on your own time to look it up. Because when we think about that, we want God in our presence, don't we? We're talking about revival. But some would say, but man, God's already in our presence. He's, he's omnipresent. He's here now. He's in the room. He's with you. Some would even say that, that God is always with me. You know, James 4, 8 says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. If we're praying and we're reading our Bible, we're studying, we're in fellowship, God is drawn near to us. Yes, yes, those are true. But there's three aspects of the presence of God. And, and this is what's happening. Isaiah is zeroing in on something. Remember, he wants God to calm down. So when he says the words, at your presence, in this context, it's different. The Puritans called this the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God. One author said it this way, trying to describe this. He said, God is experienced during this time in history. He's experienced and he's sensed and felt and known in his glory and power in an unusual way. This is when people are sensitive to sin, when they, when they hear uh, and they, they respond, they respond in bunches, in groves. God is changing the hearts of men like crazy. Brothers and sisters, the purpose, though, of revival is found for us in, in, verse, in, in chapter 64, verse 2. The purpose of this is to make his name known. Notice it doesn't say to make your name known, to make his name known. Sometimes as we think about revival, we think about revival as when we're being delivered from our enemies. In this context, we could say the Babylonians. Maybe you could think of a government ruler or somebody in, in, in government that might be oppressing you. But maybe we need to be delivered as much from ourselves as we do our enemies. I would say it this way, and I think Isaiah would agree. We don't need more of us. We need more of God. Revival, it starts with repentance and prayer and faith and the promised mercy of God. We will never, ever experience revival until there is repentance. Brothers and sisters, revival is unusual. But if God, even on this day, has stirred your heart don't go back to your usual. Rather, consider what God can do through you if you had the courage to step up and step out in faith and start praying that God would move you in ways that would disrupt everything. Isn't that what we want? We want to be turned upside down. We want God to intervene. Just know this, that when revival does come, it's a lot like Isaiah's prayer. It's messy. It's orderly. It's, it's not orderly. And things go all over the place. Rocks are placed in areas that they weren't once at. Mountains crumble. Things shake. And things quake. You know, I couldn't help but think about something when here's Isaiah saying, you know, Lord, would you rend the heavens and come down? You know, there was another time in history where that same thing happened. Remember at the baptism of Jesus? You know, that the heavens ripped open on that time. Uh, remember with Stephen, uh, he was being martyred in the, in, in, and God ripped open the sky for him. God has done these things before. He can, he can do it again. But you know what I find interesting during the baptism of Jesus in that Jordan River? You know, if you think about it, we're a sinful people. God could have easily, uh, rather than open up the heavens and have a dove come down, he could have had a lightning bolt come out of the sky, right? I mean, that's what we deserve, but he didn't do that. Rather, the dove comes down and it peacefully lands on Jesus, representing the Lamb of God. God did tear open the heavens, but instead of wrath for our sin, we receive a dove-like spirit and a lamb-like savior. Only God, only God. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord 
and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. It's Romans 10, 9. Brothers and sisters, that is true. For those who repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ, he will save you. He will redeem you. He will give you a new heart with new desires. That is the promise of the gospel. Revival is an interesting subject. It can be a bit complicated, but it doesn't need to be. We see here the greatest revival prayer in our history. I want to close by a quote that kind of blew my hair back and maybe does the same thing for you. But at the same time, it encouraged me. It's a quote by Leonard Ravenhill, and I leave you with it. The only reason that we don't experience revival is because we are willing to live without it. God bless you. At Elevate Church, we really appreciate the support you guys give us through your giving. If you'd like to help us reach and build into more people, just like Janine, feel free to give. The ways can be found below. If any of you guys watching from home are in need of some prayer for yourself or someone you know, feel free to head over to our Elevate AU app. Hit the next step button and the ways can be found through there. Thanks so much again for joining us guys. And thanks to Charlie for the awesome message. Feel free to join us again next week and maybe bring a mate.